Jared, thank you so much for joining us from Tim Suba. We're very happy to have you. Please give him a round. Good morning. Good morning. So before I get too far into this, I want to make a couple little notes off of uh, our last presenters, some things I want to kind of expound upon just a little bit. So all the time, people are always asking somebody who's into permaculture to define it. What, what is that? And, and I like to try to describe it as something that we all already know, but that we try to apply a systematic thought to. So as a way to think about that, I don't care who's in the audience, I don't care how old you are, your grandmother knew that taking the chicken manure out of the chicken coop and applying it to a compost heap and putting it in her garden was going to get her better yield out of her kitchen garden the next season. She already knew that. You don't need a permaculturist to tell you how those things get connected. And the same thing can be applied to so many other different things. Grandma knew that when you were done with that bath, you didn't have to just dump the water out on the ground. You could go put it out around the fruit tree, and it was just good enough water for the fruit tree. It didn't matter. So we can think about these kind of things, and now that we, we know Grandma did that, it doesn't matter that we know that Grandma did that. We can acknowledge the fact that we're not doing anything new. What we're doing is applying a more critical thought process to it. We're trying to say, okay, we understand like uh, in the last presentation, there was some talk about herbal medicines. We know that plants can provide medicine to people. We can sit there and look for centuries in the past and understand how these plants were used uh, to treat certain ailments. But now, in today's age, with a more scientific approach, we can study those things and come up with scientific conclusions on why they work. And when we understand why they work, we can look for other ways to implement them, and we can identify other systems that we already have in place and say, hey, wait a second, I saw this connection over here, and now that I understand that why it works over there, I know how I can apply it over to this system as well. So to me, that's what permaculture is. It's a, it's a scientific methodology or understanding of all these connections between the different systems that we have, whether it's landscape architecture, uh, uh, kitchen gardens, or full-scale designs for commercial properties, okay? All right, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Jared Stanley. I live in Waterdale County, a little tiny town of Tumsuba. If you don't know where that is, it's about halfway between Meridian and the Alabama border. So that's where I'm from. I'm in Zone 8A, uh, used to be in Zone 7B. And that's just the way things are going. <laughs> so we're always constantly having to evolve our processes, all the way because nature is constantly evolving. I want to share with you uh, something. Uh, well, uh, as was mentioned, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, you can access it just right when, if I hit the right button, you can. You can access it just going to youtube.com slash JNJ Acres. JNJ Acres is myself, Jared, and my wife, Jennifer in the back of the room there. And to me, I know you didn't come here for a lesson on marriage, uh, but I think, I think that as the uh, last presenter mentioned, there are ways that we can incorporate permaculture principles in just about anything. Like she mentioned finances and things like that. Well, in my system, me as a human being, I'm pretty good with plants. I seem to just have a knack for plants. My wife, in her system, seems to have just a general knack for animals. I'm not a very good animal guy. I don't mind going out there and, okay, I fed the animal, the animal gave me whatever product, like chicken eggs or something I'm interested in, but I'm not too concerned about the daily ins and outs of the animals, but my wife has an instinct with those kind of things. So, through our marriage, we have connected two systems, one that is good with animals and one that is connected and that is good with plants, and together, we work on j, &J Acres. So, yeah, a little food for thought, if nothing else. So uh, I hope you do go on to the YouTube channel and look me up. Right now, we're sitting at about 35,000 subscribers, and the channel overall has had over 8 million views. So if you go there, uh, if you're not familiar at all with YouTube, uh, the videos are actually, uh, on my channel anyway, are all categorized by a playlist. And you can go right in there, and there's a couple different playlists specifically for permaculture, if that's what you're interested in. So one last thing while I'm opening up here, you notice this picture? That's pretty profound. 
And yet somehow extremely simple. This, is, this profile is actually a picture of our middle child. His name's Arthur. He is now currently 11. He was about seven when the picture was taken. And there's something really special about permaculture that speaks to me. When I went through my permaculture design course, uh, Jeff Lawton, who taught the course, uh, he explained about how good children are at experimenting. You heard her mention that right at the end of the last presentation. We need to constantly experiment. And how children try out things and they just learn. They observe it and they see what's happening and they keep doing their play. So for example, it could be something no more complicated than a child playing in the dirt. And they, and they dig out a line in the dirt and they pour water in it. But the water's not getting where they want. They understand that the water's on a level and that they got to draw that line a certain way to make the water flow the way they want. So this is, a, this is an honest-to-goodness, real-life picture of my son. I was out in the field one morning, and he knelt down or, or, or kind of squatted down, and he put his finger on the ground, and he was playing with something on the ground. And I thought, that's it. That is it right there. That, to me, is where all of us need to have our minds. We need to be children looking at everything like it's brand new, trying to understand it. Why is it there? What does it do? Why is it important? And learning from that experience. So learning from that experience, the first thing I want to share with you is my opinion that in the end, nature is going to win. I don't care what you do. I don't care how pretty of a design you come up with. I don't care what connections that you thought needed to be in place. When you take out the human connection, nature is going to win. Like this sprout at the bottom of a downspout outside of a Wendy's back in Meridian, Mississippi. <laughs> that plant wants to live. Nature wants to thrive. And we just have to think of ways that we can put it better to our advantage as human beings. Here's another example of that. This again comes from Meridian, Mississippi. And I think you can tell what that is. Every town has one. That's a gas station. It used to be a gas station 30 years ago. And it just looks like an overgrown lot. But it has a roof structure. It still has concrete across the ground. But as we move in a little bit closer, you can see the gas pumps. And right at the base of the gas pump is this tree coming out. Now, just out of curiosity, can anybody here identify that tree just from looking at it from here? I'm sorry? Polonia. Polonia? The Tabo. The so that's a Catawba tree growing under a solid roof in concrete. Folks, I'm telling you, nature always wins. As soon as humans take themselves out of the equation. That's right. So, so what can we learn from this? So there's, this is where I think permaculture comes in. We don't just sit there and go, oh, it's just an overgrown lot. We sit there and start to think about why can this tree survive in this condition? What can I learn from that? And having learned that, is there anywhere else that I can apply what I just learned? So to me, what we first have to do in permaculture is observe. We should not, in my opinion, do anything on any site until we've taken the time to look at what's already there, understand why nature is doing what it's doing, because if we don't do that first, we're going to probably make a change that is going to impact the way nature is already working that might be uh, derogatory, that's not the word I was looking for, de thank you, detrimental uh, to the design plan that we have in mind. So we need to understand things like the flow of water and things like the previous presenter said. But we can't just go out there one day. We can't decide that this weekend is coming up and looks like it's going to be a really good forecast. So on Friday, I'm going to go out and look at my property. So on Saturday, I can go to Lowe's and buy the plants. It takes a little more effort than that if we're going to look at it from a permaculture mindset. We need to go out in different seasons, see where the sun is in summer, see where it is in winter, fall and spring. See what's happening when it's a dry season. See what happens when it's raining when it sprinkles and when it downpours, and take a look at these things and try to understand what is actually happening on the property. We should also identify anything on our property. Now, one thing I do want to take just a minute to mention is, I don't care if you live on a one-eighth of an acre suburban plot, or if you have 40 acres to develop into the landscape of your dream. 
permaculture does and can apply. You may do it on a completely different scale. You may only incorporate certain aspects, but it will and can apply if you take the time to observe and put things in. But identification is very important. So if you're a homesteader like myself, you might be interested in identifying wild edibles, wild medicinals, and things like that. But for landscape designers and just general gardeners, you can learn a lot about your soil condition and other properties just based on what nature is already allowing to grow in that situation. So identification is a very important <clears throat> thing. And then that's part of the understanding why it is there. Why am I having thistle grow up in this area? If you're familiar with it, then you know about what nutrients uh, thistle likes, what nutrients are deficient when thistle is present, and those kind of things. So it helps you understand the soil condition, generally speaking, before ever trying to get a soil sample tested, though you should, okay? So just, uh, I'm gonna take you through a series of slides here. My presentation is all about the story of our property in Tumusuba. I'm sharing with you some of the things that we have tried on our property that utilize permaculture principles and just show you how we do it. Uh, it's not a full design. My property is not completed. I just want you to see what we've tried and, uh, and what we've learned in doing that. So this, uh, this ought to be a little easier. Who can identify this plant for me? I only found one on my property, so I don't blame you if you're not familiar with the common milkweed. Another thing we found on our property was clover. Now, now who here sees clover as a weed? Is clover a weed? It's okay if it is. I know landscape designers, you walk through a little pretty lawn, you don't, want them, you don't want clover in there. Now clover, I just happen to have this picture. I grow it on purpose, I'm crazy like that. But to me, I see clover as being the nitrogen fixing plant that it is. I see it as being the forage that it is for wild animals and even animals on our property. I see it as being a rich source of nitrogen and other minerals that I can put into compost. So what might normally be seen by somebody as a weed plant that they don't want in their beautiful uh, preen uh, lawn, I see it as something that has multiple outputs that I can make use of in multiple systems on my property. I heard somebody else mention about pollinators. That should have been the obvious go-to. Uh, pollinators are certainly attracted to a wide variety of clovers that we can grow in this area. How about this plant? That's the little good old fashioned flower. So much we can learn about this plant. We can learn about the condition of what happened in that area before. We're typically going to find it in recently cleared pastures and things like that. But it's also a very important plant. It's not just, it, it's pretty. That's great. I love how pretty it is. Who'd like to just walk out through their yard and you see passion flowers growing? It's beautiful. But when you realize the, the uh, butterflies that it supports and all these other kind of things, uh, it's a very useful plant. And if I had not taken the time to wait over multiple seasons and see that this plant grows on my property, I could have very easily gone out there and destroyed it in one mow of the tractor and not even thought twice about it. So this is an example of observing what's already on a property before making changes. We had uh, wild mushrooms. Now I'm not a mushroom guy. Uh, somebody else identified these, I believe, as a honey something. I don't know if we have any mushroom people in the property, but uh, in the room. But wild edible mushrooms were growing on our property. Now this is not from my property, but other people, especially toward this area, are going to recognize this. What is this? Osage orange. Osage orange is, is what I know it as. Uh, hedge apple, a lot of people know it as. This plant does not grow anywhere near me. I've never seen it in Lauderdale County, but on the drive up here, I can find it all over the side of Highway 45, and I'm sure you guys have it too. So in a permaculture practice, one thing we can think about is these plants can be grown purposefully to actually create a hedge. There's a reason it's called hedge apple, not just because it grows on the edge of forests, but we can actually turn it into a hedge. We can make fences out of this and fence in an entire pasture for our animals, all at the same time while it's dropping fruit that some of those animals are going to enjoy eating. So we're, again, we're trying to connect systems. I can make a fence and feed my animals all at one time and provide shade for them and so many other things. 
This is a little bit fuzzy, but I'll just go ahead and tell you, fiddlehead firm. Anybody like eating fiddleheads? Anybody into the fiddleheads? No? Yeah, I'm not too big on either, but, but it was important to me. It, it was a great discovery. Imagine going out on your property and you're sitting there thinking about, uh, I didn't tell you at the beginning of this, we have five children, and you're thinking about, how am I going to maintain a property that's capable of feeding my family? I have two adults and five children, just about getting into two adults and a whole lot more of them. Uh, they keep growing. I don't know what it is about children. But, uh, and you're walking around and you see something like fiddlehead ferns. It may not be something that I'm interested in eating. I may not be running out the back door in my fuzzy slippers to go get the fiddlehead ferns. But knowing that they're there gives me some confidence. Nature is growing food. Nature can do this where nobody else has ever disturbed it. If nature can grow food without any human being ever being involved, if I can help in the right way, how much more produce can this land give me? How about, how about this one? It's a morning glory. I know it as a specific called a wild potato vine. Anybody familiar with those? Yeah? Again, that is growing on my seven acres out in Tune Suba. That's a, a edible tuber that nature is just growing all on its own. That again, if you just go out there and start mowing day one, you're never going to see it grow up, you're never going to see it flower, you're never going to take the time to identify the leaves, and you just found out that instead of digging up the wild potatoes growing on your own property, instead you're going to go to the store and buy some. So again, another thing that nature was providing without any human input. Now I know a lot of people here aren't necessarily here for growing food, so we can also find just beauty in our landscape. Has anybody identified this plant? Wild azaleas. I don't know too many places in the south where you can't find azaleas in a yard. I grow mine in the seasonal creek that goes through the back set of the property. So wild azaleas. Not just beauty, but also habitat for so many different animals. Good old muscadines. If you own seven acres in Mississippi and don't have a muscadine vine, come see me. You haven't found it yet. I will find it for you. <laughs> So we, we have muscadines on the property, but I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, these muscadines in particular did not come from the wild. They, they grew on a, in a specific part of my property, but because we observed nature and found a way to implement it on our property in a more humanly useful way. So we'll come back to these muscadines in just a few minutes. I think that I hit like some sort of National Geographic button when I took this picture because I'm not a good photographer, or I don't think so, but dang, did this come out good. This is a wild peach tree growing on our property. We didn't plant it. Don't know who threw the pit out. Don't know what bird dropped the pit. Don't know. But I have a peach tree growing on the side of my driveway that I never planted. Nature put it there long before we ever even bought the land. I honestly can't remember the name of this. I think it's Little Sweet Pea or Trailing Sweet Pea or something like that, but it's a wild pea. It's not something you're going to run out and go harvest. It's going to take you hours to harvest enough plants to put on the, on the plate for your family. But again, knowing that it's there lets you know about what legumes are growing on the property and how we're getting nitrogen into the soil system and things like that. So again, it was an important observation, even if it's not something I plan to go out there and try to harvest for supper one night. And this is a yeah, very unripe person. <laughs> I've only found one so far on the property, but knowing that it's there is something, isn't it? To know that uh, in a couple of years, if I give a little more TLC to this plant, because it's growing in a very extremely shady part of, of the property, uh, that I can get a little TLC, and even though nature was willing to go ahead and grow that tree, I can make sure it comes out and gives me full ripe fruit at the end of the season with a little care. But again, it's, this is actually about 10 feet away from that peach tree, and both of them are about 5 feet off of my driveway. A very prime place for you to say, oh, I want to clear this and get a little space for my driveway. I may well have destroyed the only native peach tree and persimmon tree on my property if I hadn't taken the time to observe first. Now I won't hold you back, and I want nothing against you if you don't guess this one, but this is a wild plant on my property. Does anybody recognize the flowers? It is a type of blueberry. 
or at least it is it is termed a blueberry. We can sit here and debate all day about its classification, but we're not going to go there. This is uh, commonly known as the Elliott's blueberry, uh, and it makes a small huckleberry-sized berry uh, that tastes like a blueberry and is colored like a blueberry, and they are all over my property. We lived on the land for about three years before somebody came over to my property and said, Jerry, you don't realize what you've got and pointed out how I could identify these plants even in the dead of winter when it didn't have a leaf on it. And I was able to go around my property and find out that I had dozens and dozens of these things. Now, whether or not you want to go harvest wild blueberries or not, maybe you like hunting, maybe you have a little land for hunting, maybe you have kids who are just going to get a kick out of coming over to the house and picking up some wild blueberries around June time. And it can just sit there and grow all day long in Mississippi soil without you doing a darn thing to it. This might be a little harder to identify in its unripe condition, but is that... It is a sumac. Specifically, this one happens to be the winged sumac. You can see the wings coming in between off the stems right there. Uh, sumac gets a bad reputation because of the poisonous sumac. Uh, I have gone uh, hunting uh, to harvest sumac all over the place, and I have yet to actually find poison sumac. Sumac, when it is ripe, this happens to be smooth sumac, I found in another location in the same county, makes the best uh, summertime, uh, well, late summer tea that I've ever had. And who's had sumac tea? Everybody who didn't raise their hand, you gotta go find some now. <laughs> it tastes like pink lemonade, and it is no more complicated than making lemonade. You steep it, you sweeten it if you want to, but I don't think it needs a drop of it, and you drink it. It tastes like pink lemonade, and it's just all sorts full of different vitamins and antioxidants. Great stuff. You steep the berries? Yeah, you just, you, you just, whoop, wrong button. You just clip off these flower clusters, put it in a, put it in uh, like a two quart or a sun jar, whatever you're going to make your tea in, let it steep in that. That's all you got to do. Yep. Oh my goodness. Woo. We're going Latin on me. <laughs> if it's okay, I'm going to stick with the American Beauty Bear. <laughs> I'm not really good at the uh, mechanical names of things, to be honest with you. Now, beauty berries are great. Uh, a lot of people, if you're on social media and you're inside of any kind of gardening <coughs> group on social media, people are going to always take pictures of this plant and ask for an identification because they see this beautiful bush and these pretty purple berries all over and they want to know what it is. Uh, so constantly, that's coming up on places like social media. Um, I think it's a lot of fun because the kids like to go out and harvest it. Uh, so this is, uh, this is our second youngest child, Kayla, this was a couple of years ago, and it's just about become an annual tradition for the kids to take some two-quart jugs, go out around the property, find the beauty berry trees, and bring back a, a couple two-quart jugs full of beauty berries so they can make some beauty berry jelly. So uh, the kids go all around, they collect up these beauty berries, they bring it back home, and then my uh, oldest daughter loves to make beauty berry jelly. So, great thing. So, I want you to understand what just happened here. These are plants that I have never done anything with. They just grow wild on the property. They were identified. They were never cut down. We allow them to grow. We harvest the berries. We put them in, uh, we, we, we put them in the pot. We boil them down. We turn them into jelly, and that's it. Didn't have to spend any time going outside the weedy. Didn't have to fertilize. Didn't have to do anything that our normal kitchen garden seemed to keep us doing every single week. How does it taste? Sweet. Um, <laughs> Jennifer, you got a fruit you would say it tastes like? I would say, yeah, it's got a very uh, floral flavor to it. Um, birds love it. Sorry? Birds love it. Oh, birds love it, yeah. Birds, birds love, love the weedy berries themselves. But I would say sweet and floral is the best way I can describe a, a beauty berry jelly. Okay, so I've talked a lot about uh, plants, but I want to talk about the animals too. Uh, animals are very important, whether or not you care to have livestock, collect honey, or any kind of thing that might be animal related. I don't care if you've got the first chicken or not, animals are important to your, to your system. They provide pollinization, fertilization, soil aeration, they do the planting, like that random peach tree on my property. They provide pest control, and I think above all, they provide a balance to the system on the whole. 
Animals are an important part of nature and the system. If we want to grow plants on our own and completely exclude animals, we have just completely taken away our observation of nature. Nature works because the animals and the plants work together. We need to understand how that works and then make some smart decisions about how we get away from pests that are going to kill our crops with maybe some other animals or maybe with some other plants. So there's, there's a balance to achieve and I think animals are certainly a part of that. So what, in your mind, no right or wrong answers, but what would you say would be the most important pollinator on the property? Well, the ones that are there, I'll give you that. That's a good point. Any pollinator you've got is a good pollinator. That's a great point. I guess the answer I was trying to tease out of you is a lot of people, you know, we have beehives at J&J Acres. And a lot of people think that the bees are what, the, the, the honeybees are what are doing all of our pollination. But really, pound for pound, even though honeybees are quite useful, especially in a commercial application, taking them to an orchard full of trees or a, a, a field crop that's just acres and acres and such, and we can bring in a, a beehive colony and let them pollinate. Um, in observing nature, you'll find that it's more the solitary bees, the mason bees and things like that, 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 that are really the lion's share of our pollinating in the bee world. Uh, so this year, uh, I saw it in the, in the previous presentation, they had a, a beautiful uh, insect hotel. Uh, this is a very simple buy it from Walmart uh, little mason bee house that you can put up. We had it up for about two months and all of a sudden it started getting moved in. Now, nature is nature. Not only mason bees moved in, some wasps moved in, but it was okay. They, they all shared the space, individual tubes to individual people, and, and the job got done. And I got more mason bees on the property, and so long as they're not paper wasps hanging up under the eave near my front door, I'll probably let them live. Another animal that we saw on our property when we first moved there were bats. Uh, it was really kind of exciting. We're not, you know, we, we like bats. Uh, and it wasn't a problem. And so to kind of help with that and to encourage the bats to stay in our area, we put up a bat house. So that's another option that's available to you. And it took a season or two, but now we have bats. This is very hard to see, understand. It's about 20 feet up a pole and, and, and right at dusk. Uh, but that is you looking up into the bat house from underneath it. And these are little bats hanging onto the sidewall. These are actually all pups. This is just after the parents have vacated the house to go hunting for the night, and these are the pups they left behind. So just putting up this one bee house or this one bat house uh, greatly expanded our local population for bats. Which, if you have deer flies, I highly encourage that you do as well, because these guys sure do love to eat deer and horse flies, and nobody likes to get bit by one of those. A little far away picture here. This is something I learned about several years after we had our property. Can you identify these birds from that far away? So you're wax wings. Those are cedar wax wings. And holy cow, if you've never had cedar wax wings show up in your yard, they will catch your attention when they do. Hundreds of these birds, absolutely stunning colors. And again, because we recognized the cedar trees that were on the property and did not just automatically start deforesting them, we were able to retain that habitat and bring these birds into the property. So just beautiful. Woodpeckers are very pretty. Also, again, this is, this is the part where I want to explain to you the importance of bringing a system um, to a completion. So here, this is part of our, our wooded area on our property that we haven't done much with. And to me, it's because this system has been fully developed. Nature has gone to its extreme. We have deciduous trees in the area. Nature is in the area. We have woodpeckers taking care of pests in the tree. We have squirrels going around helping us with aerating the soil, nutrition, replanting acorns, and all those kind of wonderful things. Deer on the property uh, coming in and enjoying it. That's a field pretty much full of clover. And this happens to be a rabbit we raised on our own because taking a picture of a wild rabbit down in the woods is a little more complicated than I'm capable of doing. We have raised rabbits on our property. We don't currently have any. Uh, but knowing that the rabbits are on our property in a wild way, again, just lets you know that that, that system is balanced. It is supporting so many different kinds of life. 
So taking that in and observing that and trying to understand it better. So now that we've looked at nature and observed it and thought about why things are doing what they are doing, we can start to mess with it. <laughs> and I think that's just something that's deep down inside of our hearts as humans, is we just want to mess with it and see how we can make it better. So we're going to use observation and we're going to start manipulating nature. We want to mimic nature, but we want to have it benefit us as humans. So maybe just to kind of make you think about that, I go back to my little uh, persimmon example. Sure, I have a persimmon that nature just provided, but now how can I, as a human, interfere with that in a positive way that is going to make it grow even better and provide me with the fruit that I actually want? So let's get into that a little bit. Uh, I don't know that you used the word swale in your presentation, you tricky lady. <laughs> I, I think when I talk about permaculture, people berate me about swales more than anything else. So I, I thought I would bring that up. Uh, I, I, there's a complicated way to say this, but water flows downhill at a 90 degree perpendicular angle to the slope. Okay? Wow. So, yeah. yeah you got yeah. my driving club. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, but we can use this. So you remember before, before I even really got into this, I started telling you about our son and how kids could draw a line in the dirt and they know how to make the water get to where it's going. Well, that's, that's what you're seeing here. This line, this is, this is my front yard. Welcome to J&J &J Acres. Uh, and we used, uh, now you can do this a bunch of different ways. I don't want to scare anybody off. You can take a couple sticks and a few inches of twine and you can put yourself together in an A-frame level takes only a couple minutes and doesn't cost you hardly anything. Or you can invest in a thousand dollar rotator level system that's accurate within one thirty second of an inch like I have and be like super technical about it. The end results are the same. What we've done, the water is flowing from this side down an extremely gentle slope this direction. My home is off on this side. But what we've identified is the contour line. Okay, so if you're familiar at all with your landscape design, contour maps, topographical maps, and those contour lines, what we've identified is a level across this hill. And you can see that that water is just as far down here as it is from the edge down here. So we have captured that water just long enough to let it soak into the soil and spread out. And here in this case, uh, as it happens, I didn't learn about permaculture before we bought our property. If I had, this, this uh, apple tree wouldn't be way off here in the distance. As it happens, I had already planted apple trees, and so I offset my swale a little bit so as not to damage the roots, and so far, so good. So to kind of back out, so I'm gonna show you the same area, but a little further back out. All right, so here's the swale we were, nope, that's not it. Here's the swale we were just looking at. Here is another one. And you can kind of see how, how it is. I'm telling you, if you were on my property, you may not even notice that there is a drop in elevation here. But there is a measurable one, and we can do these swales. If you look really close at that, you'll see that I live in Mississippi. The dirt's red. Uh, <laughs> when we dug this, it was painful. We spent hours. We had people come over to our house and help us dig this. It was so hard to dig it. Today, it is the softest, most supple soil on my property because of all the water that has slowly built up. Uh, you know, the uh, previous presentation talked about we always start with water because water is life. Water comes back into this soil, then so do all the other bugs, the worms, and everything else, and the whole soil starts to thrive. So what used to be almost impenetrable by a shovel and a 250-pound guy, you can now go out there and feel spongy. And that was about four years ago. So it's very important. Now, one project I have worked on in the past is the community garden in Meridian, Mississippi, known as Love and Peas. Uh, so this is Love and Peas. And I think if you look at it, it will seem pretty typical for a kitchen garden in your house or even a community garden. We've got a nice tall fence going all the way around it. We've got rows of various crops. You can see they got a cover going up. This was toward the end of fall, so they're getting ready to cover up for the first of frosts and things like that. 
And generally, we do these kind of systems because we want to keep out the wild animals from eating our crops and things like that. Sometimes it doesn't work, and the wild animals get it anyway. <laughs> That's our son Arthur again. He's the one that the uh, silhouette on the very first page is based on. So I was uh, uh, on the founding side of this. I helped design how the general layout of the garden was going to be. And a couple of years later, they came to me and said, Jerry, we want to have a food forest as a part of the community garden. Will you please design and install one? And I had about a 20 by 30 foot area to work with. Uh, so what we did, as this is that really fancy uh, rotating laser level, and, uh, and this is the area. This is the area that was designed uh, for this food forest. And I don't have a completed picture to show you. I do apologize for that. But in the end, that little area is now supporting, I think, six blueberry bushes, about six different kind, well, six different fruit trees of three different varieties, elderberry bushes, and a whole bunch of other things, uh, just in that one little area. So I went around here and identified, and what it ends up looking like is the water comes in from this corner, and it slowly goes over toward the far corner of the community garden. So what we ended up doing is digging out a whole bunch of these little uh, circles, or semi-circles, on contour, and they end up coming out looking like uh, just concentric uh, half circles. But we wanted to mimic nature. Remember I told you about that before? And I think a lot about permaculture isn't just mimicking nature, but kind of speeding it up a little bit. We can go out in the woods and watch the leaves grow over an entire season, and we can watch those leaves fall, and then we can wait for them to decompose over a couple of years, and we can get that beautiful soil that we find out in the hardwood forests. But we can speed that guy along a little bit too. Uh, so here's our oldest son. Uh, he's putting down uh, cardboard boxes as a mulch. So see what he's doing here is uh, pretty standard. There's the grass that was growing. He's putting down cardboard on top of it to help keep that grass from growing up. Uh, a very human way of producing an organic material to cover the soil. And then we're coming back around and here's our two youngest daughters <laughs> shoveling up the mulch that was delivered to the community garden and spreading that all on top of the cardboard. So the cardboard being a really good light barrier to help keep out the water, very good at soil retention, so much so you need to be careful with it at times. But this mulch is really nothing more than raking up the forest floor, really, and spreading that around. So that's one way in which that we saw how nature worked and then implemented it in a design that worked for humans. Because while we're mimicking the forest floor and water retention and things like that, you're probably not going to find that magical place in the woods where there's six different fruit trees and a bunch of blueberries and whatever else in one spot that nature did. So we bring all those things together and give them the support and the system they need to actually thrive. This is another example, it's a poor example, but I think most of you will get the point. This was our kitchen garden one year. This very large fenced-in area is where we were gardening, and we put some of our chickens out there. We probably should have put about five times as more chickens to speed the thing along, but I think everybody here is familiar with the, the abilities of chickens. They are tilling up that first inch or two of the soil, uh, making it so it's more easy to plant in. They're adding their manure to it and adding their fertility to the soil that way. So this happens in nature. Chickens wander around the woods, scratching at things and moving their manures and eating the bugs and keeping the bug population down. So why not do it ourselves? Now I, as a human, put a fence around it to keep the chickens in one place, keep the dog from playing with the chickens and things like that. But it is still mimicking nature. This, <coughs> is one heck of a fig tree. <laughs> this is my buddy Tommy Alderman. Uh, he owns Alderman Farms in Brookhaven, Mississippi. They do all sorts of things. You can look him up on YouTube as well if you want, or go down to Brookhaven, and anytime the farmer stands open, you can meet him and his wife, Patty, and they've always got stuff down there, Brookhaven. When I visited Tommy's property, I did so first as just a friend. I visited his property to buy some pigs off of him. And I visited his property because I did my design permaculture certification uh, course using his property. He has over 60 acres of land 
And he said, Jerry, one day I'd love to do this as my full-time job, be a commercial farmer. How do I do it? And so I sat down with him and designed out his whole property. But what I want to share about this fig tree, for years, Patty and Tommy thought that the only thing they were doing for this fig tree was cleaning out their chicken coop and throwing a couple shovelfuls of manure on it. They thought that was the secret to this fig tree. But then Tommy one day had a problem inside of his house, and the water pressure was low. And in trying to identify where the water pressure was going, he went up under his house and found out he had himself a leak. And for years, a little pinhole of a leak was providing water to this fig tree. And almost the entire underside of his house, you don't crawl on dirt, you crawl on the roots of a fig tree. Uh, so, so that's not necessarily nature at work. He provided that water, that unlimited tap of water. Um, but it is occurring on its own. It was not something that he intended to put into place. Well, so what can we learn from that? Well, learning from my friend's 30-foot tall fig tree here, um, I decided to implement a system similar to that on our property. And it's got several systems in it, so I want to kind of walk you through it really quick. So we've raised ducks. Uh, these happen to be Muscovy ducks. We've raised chickens, geese, and turkey on our property. And in the area that we have them penned up at night, I wanted to, uh, I, I'm lazy. Uh, <laughs> I, I think permaculture, one great benefit of it is, is it gives us a way to find something that lets us have less maintenance involved. Yes, we expect humans to interact with the system, but we don't want you to go out there every single day spending 30 minutes trying to weed the plants. Uh, so we're trying to find ways that are easier on humans and take less of our effort. Uh, so in that lazy mindset, uh, I designed this little automatic water uh, it, it evolved over time, but as it is in this picture, you have nothing more than a water pipe coming out with a little tiny spigot that's set to drip. And it just literally, just constantly made a little drip every second. Now, at the end, the, the ducks are covering it up, but there's an overflow. Uh, so just like uh, the last presentation said, you can have rain barrels, but if you don't compensate for what your max capacity is, you're going to run into waste or problems. But I didn't want waste. So what I did is I put an overflow into this trough, and it goes under the ground outside to this area. Uh, now this being the outdoor run for the chickens at the time, and you can see this little white PVC pipe going into the water that the chickens were doing. Now, I don't have a picture of the whole completed system because the whole completed system is not there yet. But what we ended up doing is planting a fig tree right around here. And it's been about three years and that fig tree is about 15 feet tall. Uh, I don't really know how average or not that that is. But here's how this system is kind of being thought of. Here's the thought process in our minds. The chickens and the ducks need water. We give them some clean water inside. It overflows and it goes out here to this pond. This little pond, the chickens and the ducks like to play in it. They manure in it. They provide fertilizer all over this entire area. So we're giving a lot of nutrients into that. The thing you can't see in these pictures and very well is my property slopes in this general direction. We're almost on a ridge. And so if you were to draw a contour line, you could draw it right around the edge of a hill right here. And then it just keeps going down the further out that you go in this little horseshoe kind of shape. So this water as it is, is just going to either sit there or at some point overflow itself, which it does currently comes off of the shelter. We're not capturing that rain. That would be an excellent way to improve this system. We could capture the roof water and supply that roof water into the water where I'm just coming out of municipal water. So I could replace the municipal water with rain water by just adding one more component to the system. But here, we, uh, we later dug out a little overflow here, which then goes down the hill. And in the future, we're going to put in more of those swales like I showed you before. And we just keep reusing the water. So all this water's got all these nutrients from the ducks and the chickens. We keep feeding it down the system and keep supplying nutrients to the soil and to the plants. All right, we're going to kind of speed this up a little bit. I think everybody in here is pretty familiar with compost. Uh, compost is my favorite way of providing nutrition to plants. It's a slow and steady method rather than a good punch right to the face like some of our other ways of providing nutrients. 
Plus, it's going to improve the soil ecology, the diversity of the soil, the tilth of the soil, and things like that. To do that, a lot of people in permaculture are going to use this plant, which if you're not too familiar with it, most people are not. I apologize if this group largely is, but this is true comfrey. There are different varieties of it. This one happens to be um, the, the, the original, the true comfrey, which means uh, in this aspect that its seeds are viable. There are hybrids of this where the seeds are sterile and can only be propagated by root cuttings. Um, but this is a great plant used by a lot of permaculturists because it can and does grow like a weed, but it has this humongous tap root that, uh, tap root that brings up nutrients and it stores it in the leaves, which you can then use in compost, you can use it as a forage for your animals. We would go out there and chop down entire plants take them over to the chickens and they would just have a heyday with it. When we first started doing compost, we used one of these systems. I was not very good at using one in terms of, I just never went and used it. Uh, so uh, the point I wanna make with this is that I'm not too concerned about how you compost. I just hope that you take a little more consideration about how compost is a way to mimic nature and give your plants the nutrition that they need. Here's another way that we were doing it with different piles of uh, things. You see I've got a whole lot of uh, nitrogen green plants down here. That is not apple juice in that show. Uh, and, and we were making compost on the property using scraps. Another nice thing about compost is if you happen to have a sun that's got a little too much energy, you can save your back and put it to work. <laughs> Uh, but you can also do uh, composting in layer methods. They can be tall, they can be short and fat. But what's important about compost to me, especially if you're gonna do like a hot composting method, uh, is that observation. Now you can get good at it and get to the point where you know that if you stick your hand in, you can go so far, it's about this temperature and those kind of things. Um, I don't trust myself, I'd rather read the thermostat. Uh, so or the thermometer. So I'm gonna put the thermometer in there and keep track of uh, how that's going. Now you'll notice in our compost, it's not just straw. Uh, you can't hardly make out little round pellets like that, and that's because at one point we raised rabbits. The rabbits for us, again, are a multi-source system. Yes, we were raising rabbits for the purpose of consuming them for food. Uh, however, you could raise them to sell to people as pets if that's what you wanted to do. You could just have one or two that you keep as pets and then you can turn around and instead of throwing their manure away, you can put it in the compost. Rabbit manure is an absolutely excellent thing to put inside of your garden. Maybe a little more practical, if you don't want to raise animals, could be a worm bin. Uh, so this is just about as lazy as you can get, so I like it. Uh, this happens to be a bathtub that was on my neighbor's property. I saw it sitting in the woods, he had two of them, and I said, hey, can I have one of those? He said, sure, take whichever one you want. So I took this one and we set up a system where, where the water would normally drain out. We put a valve on it so we can take the excess water. They like to call it compost tea or I can't remember the specific word for when it's worm tea, but uh, pours out into this bucket and we can take that bucket, go around and water plants. We can, uh, we see we're adding both, uh, this is shredded paper uh, from my work and greens cut from the garden. And we just add it in there and the worms thrive. And when it's all done, you get uh, the worm case, uh, castings or, or their manure. And we use this little shaker box on an old swing set. So I can throw compost in there, I shake it back and forth, I get compost so fine that I can start seeds inside my house with it. Um, but then I can take the bigger chunks and throw it back into the compost pile, let it go a little further. Now, I'm going to kind of start closing up here, and I want to do it with one of the bigger projects we've ever done on the property. And this is back to those muscadines I mentioned before. This is a grape arbor that we installed on the west side of our house. So our home happens to sit lengthwise exactly east and west. So the long portions of my house face exactly north and south. Um, oh, moving forward. Uh, so, so this is where that project started. Uh, so a lot of different things going on here I'm going to mention really quick. We've got the rain gutters coming down and instead of putting it into a rain barrel, we put it underground and then this pipe here, just like a field pipe for a septic system, is riddled with holes. 
So we just put holes all over that pipe, and then it's not finished in that picture, but in this picture you can see a stand pipe right there, so that's our overflow to make sure that the water doesn't somehow back up into the pipe. So there's an overflow right here in the center at the bottom, so it can overflow and keep going down the hill if need be. There, there could have been several ways to implement that, but that's how we did it. And so we're constantly providing soil to, or moisture to this soil. For a frame of reference, that's seven feet away from my foundation. And it is downhill, so that's about a, it goes almost flat uh, away from the house for about four feet, and then it slopes down for the last three feet. So there's no way for that water to come downhill back toward my foundation. Then we put in a whole bunch of T-posts and cattle panels. We attach the cattle panels to the T-posts and to the home and bent them in a half arc kind of fashion. This is a year later, and you can see uh, how the muscadines are growing. We trim them just as you might be familiar with. There's the main stock with all the shoots coming off. And we have had more muscadines than we care to try to imagine. Uh, so it's been great. This has significantly dropped the exposure of the sun on this west side of the house, which happens to be my bedroom. So just about the time of day where you're ready to go in the bedroom and rest, it happened to be the hottest room in the house. It is now, today, the coldest room in the house because we observe that muscadines like to grow way up tall pine trees, so we know they're going to climb the 20 feet it takes to get all the way up that cattle panel. We know that they like growing in the soil because we already found them on our property, and we know my kids are going to eat them, so we're going to put it in. But the, the human benefit of it isn't just the food, it's the shade it provides as well, which then lowers my utility bill and so many other things. So there's some of the muscadines growing uh, midway through the season, and again, the muscadines that we grew. Uh, just one couple, a couple little last notes. I think permaculture, anybody who teaches permaculture is probably gonna tell you that you should grow perennial wherever possible. If your options are, I could put in this annual plant, or I could get the same exact thing if I put in this perennial plant, put in the perennial one. They're easier to maintain, they're more cost-effective, and more adapted to the climate that you're growing them in. But don't get me wrong, we love our annual plants too. I'm not telling you not to have a kitchen garden. We go out there and harvest and grow annual plants all the time. In fact, I like annual plants sometimes because remember, nature always wins. This cucumber will not give up. <laughs> that is a one quarter inch by one quarter inch rabbit stay out of my garden hardware cloth, and that cucumber still grew through it. So, but despite how hardy that cucumber is being, the perennial plants are more so. So here we are back again to the Elliott blueberry, um, the apple trees that we're growing, the persimmon and a plum tree. So the persimmon and the Elliott's blueberry were already on the property. The plum tree and the apples, we added later. But it doesn't just have to be food. We talked about this before. You can, uh, again, use just for beauty uh, and for habitat. So the wild azaleas or dogwoods that are growing on our property. And the last thing I want to mention, because I knew this was a landscape symposium, I didn't want to get into animals too much, even though I feel how important they are to the system. Just a quick touch on rotational grazing. So you'll notice in each one of these four pictures that we're using this portable electric net fencing. You can get them that I'm electrified as well. Um, but the interesting thing about this is to consider how nature works on its own. So here's an example, very quick, of what we would do. The goats don't want to eat grass. Goats eat grass as a last resort. They would rather forage off of plants that are right at their head level. They'd rather eat the brambles and the thorns. Or said another way, they want to eat just about anything that the other livestock is not interested in. So we put them into a pasture first. Then once we've had them in there just long enough that they've eaten what nobody else is going to eat, before they start getting so bad off, they're going to start grazing on the grass. We rotate them out to the next section, and then we might do something like bring in the horse. And then the horse, with all those thorny things out of its way, is going to happily graze away at the grass. But as that horse is doing so, uh, just like if maybe instead of a horse we put in cattle, there's going to be some large manure piles left behind. So maybe the next thing we put in are chickens. 
The chickens go through and scratch out the manure, spread it through the field, so I don't have to drive a tractor through the field trying to churn up my manure and spread it across. The chickens take care of that stuff for me. They aerate the soil a little bit. They add not only uh, the, the horses or the cows manure to the system, but their own as well. And then we can rotate the ducks in and let the ducks take care of whatever little sludge might be left or things like that. The end result being that by the time the goats come back around, the soil is healthier, the plants have more nutrition in them, and the goats get more feed from nature that I don't have to buy and I don't have to go try to feed them. So rotational grazing is a great way to get multiple uses out of one pasture or a set of pastures. You just have to set it up and time it out right based on the number of animals that you're trying to support. So that's it. That's all I have for my presentation. I hope that maybe you've learned something about this, uh, and I will happily be able to afford any questions. <laughs>